What is up there everyone? Welcome to another dynamic conversation. In this episode, in this dynamic conversation, I have invited a friend of mine named Rich Ailing, a former Wim Hof instructor, a certified yoga teacher, life coach, and the founder of Realign Coaching, where he offers one-on-one coaching and mentorship live events and courses. Some of the things that we talk about in this conversation are how to make tough decisions, dealing with haters or people who dislike you, the search for meaning, and a few more topics that you will soon come to discover yourself. If you want to check out Rich and check out his work or read more about his personal story, then be sure to check out his website realign.co or follow him down on Instagram at richrealign. Now, those links can be found in the description of this episode where as well you can find a link to the show notes. And in the show notes, you can find any resources or any person or you know anyone or anything that we talk or mention in the conversation that can be found in the show notes so uh, do check them out one last thing that i also like to drop here is that rich also has a youtube channel uh, where amongst other videos uh, he also has a very interesting series called a depth of connection and the reason why i like to drop that is in that series he interviews um, people about their journey, about the things that they're currently teaching, but also about COVID-19, their opinions and their thoughts about it and how they're handling it. Uh, And because these are tough and challenging times, um, I just thought it was maybe helpful for some people to check that series out. I myself found it very interesting and and helpful uh, because they are all very, the people that he interviews are all very thoughtful people. Uh, with uh, very helpful opinions, I would say. Just wanted to drop that here, uh, that it could be interesting and worth it to check out as well. Um, You can find his YouTube channel by either searching Rich Ailing or Richard Ailing, or as well in the description, you can find a link to the YouTube channel. But with that, I hope you enjoy this dynamic conversation between me and Rich Ailing. Let me throw a question at you here Uh, and I also want to give actually some of my takes on it Uh, but I'm super curious on your takes on it as well and the first one that I actually have is how to make tough decisions. So making decisions, making tough decisions is something that everyone throughout their whole life will have to do many many times right and the more tools you actually have in your toolbox on how to help yourself with making those or making tough decisions, the better you can, you can make decisions. And I think it's a really important skill to have more tools in. And I thought it might be really interesting to both learn from each other, maybe some more new tools or to just get a refresher of some old tools that we haven't seen for a while. And for anyone listening as well. Right? So how to make tough decisions do you, what are your tools? What are some of the things that you do where you have to make a tough decision? And we can go between this, right? Like you can share a few things. I can share some other things or if all of them come out, you know, go on then. Wow. That's a really good question. Um, For me, I always come come back to the idea, probably Tony Robbins that said it, but God knows he probably didn't come up with it, but decisions are the biggest things that we can make in our lives, you know? Um, and I try not to get caught up in, you know, too much thinking about it. I try to make a decision as quickly as possible so that I can find out if it was the right one and learn from that. That's really a perspective. And so I don't think too much about decisions and therefore there aren't too many tough decisions. Um, tough decisions to me, can you give me an example of what you might, uh, think yes. of because the ones that I think about are in relationship or whether to move country or not but sure that's just my life so what about you yeah so this question came up because of in recent months I had to make a tough decision in terms of a relationship or a potential relationship that I that wasn't working um, and that's a tough decision right so that's an example I don't know if that brings anything up 
Um, but I can otherwise share a few of the tools that I use because I've thought a little bit about this question now. Uh, and so it's a bit harder when you haven't to immediately come up with any. So uh, a few of the tools that I actually wrote down are one essential tool is when you have to make a tough decision, sleep a night over it. I think that's such an essential and vital thing for anyone to do before you make any tough decision or big decision, right? Sleep one night over it and have a fresh memory, uh, your brain functioning freshly again. You can, clear, you can think so much more clearly when you do that. Super important. Uh, and I think one that you were actually a bit referring to is, I don't know exactly, right? right? But, um, and this is the thing with the, the relationship that I was saying, uh, is to, to listen to your gut feeling. You know, like deep down, you do know the answer to the decision that you have to make. And your head with more thinking can make it more foggy, can make it more confusing. Where your gut feeling, the, the feeling inside, right? What is, feel, like, what is happening there and, and, and listening to that? Because more often than not, it is, it is correct. It, it, like, it knows what you want. Um, I'll share one more and then maybe if there's anything else that came up, I'll let you. Um, this is actually from someone, uh, his name is Derek Sh uh, Sivers. Uh, he's the founder of CD Baby, um, which is like a... Um, a music website, uh, well, doesn't matter actually, but one of the things, a quote that he has, that I always remember is that if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And basically what that means is that, and maybe it doesn't apply to everything, but if you're not 100% feeling it, then it's probably a no. Or if it's a maybe, then it's probably a no. But if it's like a hell yes, you know, like a yes that you 100% know, that's a yes. Uh, otherwise, it's probably a no. Um, yeah, I have two more, but I'll let you, uh, if you have any, any other things that come up. Well, to speak to what you just said, I think that's really interesting. And <clears throat> you've used the word feeling quite a lot. Emotions and emotional tension is, is what kind of comes up. And how do we know if we're actually even listening to our intuition or is it just, you know, fear? Because... The, the, the two kind of related things actually mm -hmm. and what helps for me is definitely to sleep on something that's always a good decision for me personally um some people know already though you know and if they wait too long then then they start to overanalyze and so they need to go with that initial kind of decision first so it depends what kind of person you are but for me mm -hmm. it helps to sleep on something like you know when you kind of go into a shop and you there's a thing that you think oh that's really cool i want that that's a lot of money. Okay, do I need that? Ah, yeah, but mm, go away. Do I still want it like, you know, two or three days later? Yeah. yeah. Then, right, it's just kind of that, oh, there's, there's something there and I feel like I want it. In terms of a relationship or what a big decision like that, or anything where you're committing to a very different kind of future, potentially, mm -hmm. it really helps me to just kind of sit with, and it comes back to feeling again, because that's really how we make decisions, right? Is to sit with it and then, okay, imagine that future for example, your example, with that person as it is or an improved version of that. And are you kind of feeling good about that? Are you open? Are you expanding? Or are you kind of contracting and, and sitting into what your body is actually doing? Mm. That requires a level of sort of um, uh, connection to the body, right? But we don't have to be some kind of like guru to, to be able to tap into that. It just takes a moment of presence. Then the opposite. Okay, how am I going to feel when I'm not with this person? And again, just tap into that sense of opening con or contracting. And to use more kind of simple language, it could also be something like, you know, relief, <laughs> a lightness, you know, and your body doesn't lie. It's like, okay, it's true. most of the time in these tough decisions, we're actually just trying to avoid the feeling that's going to come when we have to let that person go uh -huh. in some way, really. Um, and so then it's like, and your body will know that. Be like, no, nah, I, need, I need to get away from this, actually. Otherwise, that question would really come up. Um, so relationships is a special one for me. Um, but that's generally how I would uh, feel into uh, most tough decisions, you know? Like, I um, was living in Bali. Do I go back to Europe now? Do I move to China? You know, 
part of me was thinking about the money and the security that, that was going to buy me moving to a certain place for a certain time. Well, that's a pretty cool thing to have, right? But is that what excites me? Like, where's my heart? And if my heart was in Europe, you know, I could feel that. It's like I'm more excited about being where I am now. And so I made the decision based on that. If, it's, if you make a decision and you know that you're making a decision based on safety, certainty, financial security, um, that's a pretty limited place to make a decision from. That's, that might serve you, make you feel safe, but... As we know in life, nothing's safe, nothing's certain, especially this year. Mm-hmm. So what's the point in holding on to that? If you're penniless or in massive debt, I, I get it. <laughs> sure. But if most decisions are, are being, that's an extreme, but most decisions are being made from that place of, I just want to feel safe, that's, um, that's going to lead to a, a, a limited way of experiencing life, I would say. Yeah, love that. Um, yeah, we so often just use the head to make a decision but forget the body actually, which is, yeah, an essential part of your whole everything, right? So it will be also good to listen to it a few times more because it helps to make tough decisions. Uh, two more things that I just want to add here of, of what I had. Um, so this is actually one that I recently sort of discovered from a person named Kevin Kelly. Uh, and it, it, it is it's kind of per, I'm paraphrasing what he wrote down, but if, what if it will be tomorrow? So basically what it, what it means if it's easy to make, um, to make a decision to do something in a month, say with someone that you want to do a travel, it's easy to say yes, if it's going to happen in a month. Right. But if you would actually, even if it is a month, but if you would actually take it to what if it would be tomorrow, would I still say yes on this? So to, to, to the, the urgency to kind of make it more urgent so it becomes more real. Like when you make a decision or when you are trying to s- decide on something, try to make it to tomorrow, even if it's going to be in a month or two. But ask yourself, would you still want to do this if it would be tomorrow? And that's actually a, a new kind of tool that I uh, discovered that actually was really helpful um to me and then the last one is and this is a bit too with with the 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 relationship that i was talking about um on ending that or telling that person that it wasn't working out for me um is um is to like so i i was able to either because she lives like two hours from, from me, right? And I, would, I could have just texted her to say like, okay, it's not working out. Uh, or I could have called her to do that. But both of those two ways aren't... So what I mainly want to get to is how do you want to look back on this? I think that's a really important thing to make an important decision and to put yourself in 10 years and to think, how do I want to look back on that decision that I made? And am I proud that I made it like that? Because neither calling her or texting her to end it would have been a good decision that I would be happy with. So instead I drove two hours, had a conversation with her and drove back two hours. And it was effort and energy, but she totally deserved that. And I'm very happy on that decision. Uh, and so that's also another one that I have. Um, yeah, that's that's a few of the tools that I use. I like that as well. And it, the question I love to use is, is it a good decision or is it a bad decision? You know, for me, I'm like, what's in integrity? You know, because that is how I'm going to look back on myself. Was that in integrity or not? And I, uh, back in 2008, I was living in a part of Germany and I was with a, a woman and it was a cool relationship. I relocated to another part of Germany to study and actually found myself wanting to kind of live there. And I did. And the way that I ended it with her was like, this is one part of Germany to the other. This wasn't two hours. This was like, you know, six hours on the train. Sure. Germany. <laughs> it's you. <huge. laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, a little bit bigger than Belgium, right? Like, yeah. um, so that was, this is the same quandary for me. And I, this is 12 years ago as a young chap. 
Um, but I didn't make a decision in integrity and I avoided that. And so I actually called her up instead. Mm-hmm. And um, that wasn't a great way to end it. And it's ironically maybe two weeks ago that we actually got in touch and spoke again for the first time in 12 years. Interesting. And me now was like, look, I'm really sorry. Yeah. that I, like, I would never have done that in knowing what I know now. I just didn't have the integrity back then. I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I hurt you, you know? And, and she was like, thank you. And that was really cool. That was beautiful. And so I don't want to look back like that. I don't have many instances like that, but every time I do look back with regret, it's a case of, I was too scared to feel something, yep. you know? So it's more a case of the decision fundamentally how I approach it in a different, different angle is what do I want to feel and what am I avoiding feeling? And when we get real with those kind of states of emotions and then that, that's really the barrier to making a decision. That question for me, when we can be real with both of those scenarios, then okay, it could be either of those things that we could end up feeling or we would be avoiding feeling. Let's just make the decision and you know just feel what needs to be felt because that's what's holding us back, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes, tough decisions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was actually a question out of, uh, some of the things that I had, I don't know if you want to share anything more on this or if you want to contune to something that you had on your list. (laughs) Yeah, I think I've, I've said, um, all I have of value, otherwise I'd be, um, potentially babbling. I think that's, that's how I approach decisions. I don't have a problem uh, making them very often. Yeah. I guess the other thing, there's one other thing actually, you know, that isn't babble that's worth sharing. Neither of us have touched on, and that is just checking in with somebody else. You know, that's a good one. Yes, that's a really right. Good one. I mean, that's, that's we should. Yeah. My coach, my former coach, would say like the, the problem is never the problem; it's feeling alone in the problem. And a decision weighing on your mind can feel like a pretty big problem. Yes. So speaking to that with someone else and going, look, you know, not just like, what would you do? Well, that's not the worst thing you can say, but Mm -hmm. someone else that can just kind of act as, you know, sort of uh, someone impartial and be like, you know, have you thought about this? And just giving you that fresh perspective, which is, um, Mm -hmm. it could be a (laughs) mum, it could be a good friend, you know, but someone that's close to you that you trust, that's, um, that's always a good idea as well. Love that, that you added that to this, because that's, honestly something that i'm trying to get better at to just ask someone a good friend you know what you would you do or what would you think and every time that i did it it was so helpful that uh yeah um but so few people well i shouldn't i don't know of, of that but many many friends that i do have also don't do this enough i feel to ask for just Advice from a friend. Um, so I love that. You yeah, because that. we think we need to, uh, we think for some reason that we need to, you know, be strong and, and make decisions yep. ourselves. And that means that we're, yep. you know, reliable and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think men, uh, mm. <laughs> by and large, are the ones that tend to have that problem, right? Yes. Like it's, just, it's a sign of weakness. And that's a part of, uh, well, for one of a more dramatic phrase, the crisis of masculinity that we're in, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like, that's why there's such a higher suicide rate among among men, um, particularly in Australia, because of that kind of character of can't show any weakness, can't express emotions or feelings. It's like, Mm -hmm. that's madness. And we're starting to see that, right? It's true. And the same thing also that, that if you don't know, like, we should know everything. I don't know if that's particular with men, I mean, probably with women too, but it definitely feels with, with men often that they should know everything. And that's also the thing. Cause like it, it leads to when you don't know that you're weak or not smart enough, which equals to weakness or something. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we should, we should ask for more advice. <laughs> it, it's not all of the, yeah, it's no fault of women that, you know, we, we feel like we should know things. That's, that's kind of part of the cultures that we often grow up in. Yep. Um, we, we need to catch up as men in, in so many ways on that front, I think. Agreed. Yes. Yep. All right, nice. Um, all right, go on with or go ahead uh, with anything out of, of your list. I'm curious. All right. It's a very topical issue. So depending on when this uh, goes out, the the way in, the context, the way into this uh, 
topic is is relevant to the day, but it's the future of uh, America, and, and um, I'm more interested in talking about and how that relates to the rest of the world. Um, yeah. So you know, as we're talking, it's like election day, and it's too tight to call right now. Um, and I'm not going to try and predict anything, but the fact that it's such a close race for me is, is just terrifying. The fact that Donald Trump has received more votes than he did four years ago mm-hmm. um, from people. You know, it's just terrifying. And what that says about who people are willing to support and, and the, aside, you know, the idea that it's okay to just talk shit and, and how he's behaved in the deconstruction of just our trust in each other, in information sources and in everything. Um, I'm very really glad I'm not in America right now. And uh, I don't want to pity America. I don't want to say it's a complete disaster. There are just so many amazing things that are going on there, but it is also very much a failed state at the moment. Like how, uh, just to get a sense of how are you feeling about that? And, and do you see that as being relevant to kind of your, your life? Or do you just see it as like some distant thing? Does, yeah, does it affect you? Uh, does it affect me? I guess in certain ways, even if it's not in Europe, it still affects people here too, right? Of what we see in the media or, or, or so. Um, but I think, does it concern me? It's maybe not. Well, in general, <laughs> and this is, I, I, I don't pay too much to be honest, attention to politics. And maybe I should, I don't know, but it's just, I don't feel sometimes that I can contribute much to it by paying it more attention to it. And I'm probably wrong in it, I don't know, but it's just, I I feel a lack of interest actually uh, to give an actual opinion on this because I don't think too much about it. I focus so much on my work and my study that everything else outside of it, I, I, I don't bother too much sometimes to pay attention to it because it would distract me from what I feel is important to me. So maybe not an answer to what you wanted to get into maybe, but uh, that's honestly what I, what, yeah, my honest answer to that. But d- how for you though? Like, because if you have that question, it's probably something that you've been thinking about. Um, are, so you said that you're worried about it. Well, to acknowledge what you said, like, I get it. And um, I spent many years as a heavily kind of cynical, kind of world-weary human, having studied certain subjects related around law, politics, sociology, media, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wanted to be right and know about things and be able to argue and, and got heavily into that world. And really, when I stepped away from it and took the position you do, it's just like, you know what, like, it's just going to distract me from me and the stuff I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. It was a big freedom. And so I fully understand and respect where you're at with that. And yet I find myself being sort of tugged back in. Sure. Um, and yet yeah, to, to what extent and to, to what value? You know, it, is that helpful to, to kind of be aware of this kind of stuff where it does seem so far away? I guess my concern is really that what it's doing to the fabric of society, and not just Donald Trump as a disgusting specimen, <laughs> um, oh, but, you know, what he embodies in, in yes. terms of, it relates to another question I want to talk about, you know, which is um, maybe we sort of lean into that, but uh-huh. this divisiveness that we're experiencing where it's us and them, yeah, and, you yeah. Know, not being able to trust any kind of information sources that that speaks to a lot of what's happening that does then affect our lives in terms of how we communicate our own messages, how we uh, sell ourselves, how we um, the, the integrity we need to have mm-hmm. versus people that can make any kind of claims or the misinformation that people can make. And if we move it to an area which you and I can relate to, I think, in terms of um, self-development, you've got so many, it's such an unregulated industry, it's not even challenged, you know, in terms of what people can say that they are and what they do. Yeah. And how often, especially during lockdown, have we seen, have I seen, uh, webinars you can sign up for and you've just got this whole host of people you've never heard of and each one of them is like, you know, the world's leading expert on dot, 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 dot. And you're just like, oh, fuck. It's, there's something wrong with, uh, 
the freedom that we have to just say and do what, whatever we want with, without any sort of challenge or, or even self kind of, you know, challenge. That, that, that's a big problem for me. And, and he embodies that aspect of just like, yeah, I just kind of can say what I want as well. And, and it doesn't even matter. Yep, yep. And yet people kind of vote for him because, you know, they, 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 they kind of trust that there's someone out there that just can do that. And I don't know what that says about society or culture, but I do feel like it speaks to where we are in terms of how we're communicating and, and then it just divides off into other topics of you know identity politics and that being a very much kind of a, a left position now you know and this is you can't say this you're racist if you say that you're transphobic if you say that and it's you know language is becoming a, a, a tricky topic um and mm. being offended and all that kind of stuff and that's the sort of left position and you've got on the right someone like donald trump just kind of being the opposite of that and just saying I don't give a shit. <laughs> and, and, and if you if you don't vibe with the judgments that some of the, the left uh, is, is coming, coming out with at the moment, and that's not to say I have a problem with, um, you know, equality of opportunity, not at all. I think it's a beautiful thing. But there's something on the left which is happening which is a bit clumsy at the moment and it's overreaching. And anyone that doesn't vibe with that is then going to probably look towards Donald Trump. Mm. You know, that, that feels like that's what's happening in America. So that possibility, that's, that's worldwide. You know, mm. that kind of, um, that divide feels like it's happening in other countries as well. And so I'm just like, is this what's to come here? Like, what's going on with that? Mm. So is it this feeling of, like, what is mainly frustrating you about it? Like, is it like... Because you were also saying something about that everyone is calling themselves an expert. Was this good? Yeah. Good. No, no, no. Yeah, like thanks for picking that back up. I mean, my core values are being, you know, kind of triggered and tested here, you know, and that's not just, that's, I don't want to make value judgments of other people, mm -hmm. but when I, you know, when I'm like trust, honesty, responsibility, and integrity at the core of what I do and what I offer as a human, yet alone as a professional, yes. um, you know, to friends and, and to people that I work with and work for, I'd like to see that, you know, around me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because when we're working in the realms of, uh, you know, relationship and being honest with each other and kind of growing in any kind of area, personal, spiritual, whatever it is, then these are really important tenets and values to have. True. And then people that um, have learned the language of how to sell themselves, be it Donald Trump on the world scale, or it's you know, someone who can do marketing very well, but maybe the skills in self-development aren't really there. Yeah, they're, uh, they're right up there. And I have enough money, um, like a bit more if I'm honest, long term, but my life's great as it is. So it's not about like, I need that fame, I need that attention. Like, I had to really sit with that and make sure that was clear. So then it came back to what is this really? And it's like, it's about integrity. And people are looking for leadership. They're looking for growth. They're looking for meaning, I think, in the world right now. And yet the people that are shouting the loudest have really questionable values. And yep. yet they're getting all the attention because of that. You know, right. it's like there's something, there's something empty. There's, there's a shell yep. of experience happening right now for me. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So if you care, if you greatly care about something and you see other people pretending that they care, but they don't seem to actually care, it hurts so much more, right? Because you truly care about helping and all right but if everyone is el else is calling them an expert without having actually any real experience or or any knowledge on what they're talking about and you do then it's that much more uh, like um irritating to see so many people call themselves expert on subjects uh that they are not and it's too easy right to call yourself an expert these days uh it's just a word that you have to type out now so I get what you mean on that point of being frustrated with so many people calling them experts. And I guess that's the link with Donald Trump that is, he's a role model too, right? Like so many people see him, not a role model to look up to per se, right? But either way you are as 
someone out there on the media, you will naturally become a role model to some people. And you can be a good one or, an, or, or a bad one, but either way, he is showing to other people things that aren't, that you shouldn't install actually in you of saying random things, of calling yourself great and expert and all those things. Um, at least that's the connection that I feel like you can see why you were bringing up Donald Trump and that of uh, people calling themselves experts. Or am I just completely getting things wrong right now here? No, I hear what you're saying. I think um, you've, you've, you've actually also brought up this other point of, you know, kind of fake authenticity as well. It's like anything that has a value needs to be marketed now. <laughs> you know, sure. like in, in any way that we can stand out on social media in order to well, peddle whatever we have to. It's also because there's, so it. there's also so much noise, right? So in a way, you almost have to, if, if you like it or you don't, you have to in a way because there's too much, too many people, too much noise. So you need to market, yeah. Uh, whether you actually know what you're talking about or not. Sorry Completely. to interrupt. Um, no, 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 yeah, no, I agree. I, mean, I, I posted something just today actually, and I'm like, I haven't got a problem with, uh, I think just to qu quote myself, like I haven't got a problem, I'm not here to pick apart like who is here to offer what or how they do it, because it's a free market that we live in, yep. and you either play the game or you complain about it. You know, that's what I said. It's like, I, I have no problem with that aspect. I mean, the fear of marketing yourself is, that's more of an internal thing, like, oh, how will I come across? And that's your own thing to deal with and then your own hurdle to overcome. But the fact that authenticity is, you know, just such an important value of mine as well, um, that's a way to stand out, but it's now become marketed. So it's not even real anymore. You know, it, it's, it's something that a lot of people have, um, at least in my world, have, have kind of got on board with and decided that it's something that they need to make a big deal with, like, you know, authenticity is really important. And, and they'll start a post by saying something like, um, you know, vulnerable share. It's like, ah, is it? <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lack of depth, I guess, for me, that it just feels a bit um, inauthentic, actually. Wait, your world, you mean the world of, like, life coaching, like life coaches or yes. which, excuse yeah, me. Yeah. yeah. I'm not on a different planet. Well, I am sometimes, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I don't know. Just I mean, to get I mean, some clarity on it and stuff like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 Totally. Right. Do you not find that as well? I mean, you've got, uh, you're familiar with marketing courses and, and um, putting yourself online on, on different platforms, um, which anyone can and should be able to offer their thing on. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's something around, uh, the, the problem is the end result. Let's be really clear. This isn't about me versus dot, dot, dot. The problem is what it means for the world, what it means for communication, it means for trust. And this is why we have the same problem with what's going on over the states as well. When you say anything you want, when nothing can be trusted, when you backtrack, when you say something and then you just say the opposite thing the next day, no one trusts information anymore. Yep. You know, and then we're in a place where uh, how can we fact check anything? Is anyone interested in doing that? And your truth is as is, is real to you as my truth is. And you want to find validation for your truth, whatever that is, you're going to find it online. That's why conspiracy theories are just going bananas. You know, it's like, oh, my God. Um, and <laughs> I'll just create separation now, I guess, by anyone that's, you know, into that kind of thing. But fucking hell, like QAnon, like let's sit down and have a talk and find out what you're really angry about because that shit is off the charts, just crazy, batshit, fucking crazy. Like, I, I don't even have words to describe that, but doesn't that concern you? And like the, the, the version of that that's no doubt forming over in little Belgium too? Or is your door locked and you're just fine? Wait, sorry, can you say what, what, what concerns me? What? The version of, you know, conspiracy theories and, and oh. kind of deep-rooted fear that, that people project onto others, whether Look, it's, you know, yeah. Hollywood and Melinda Gates are all eating babies or whatever the hell's going on, you know, like... Look, you can't stop people from wanting to think whatever they want to think. And does it concern me? In a way, for sure, but it's sort of like whether 
it is a concern or not, I can't change too much or stop someone from thinking anything that they want to think. So uh, with that thought, I don't feel like it's much of value to me to, to have concern about it too much. Um, it's just, yeah, for me, just focusing on things that I feel like I can have impact and control over. Um, yeah, so I, 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 yeah, but of course there are ridiculous conspiracy theories going around that are potentially harmful, um, but everyone has the freedom to believe in what they want to believe, and that's fine to me, uh, as long as you, I feel, truly have thought about it. Uh, I think, yeah, that's all I Do you think see. anyone that believes that, you know, there's a Hollywood cabal of um, pedophiles that eat their babies and stuff, like have sit down and sat down and thought about it? Do you think there's something going, yeah, what's the likelihood? And, you know, I'm just going to gonna fact check this story that Keanu Reeves said this thing and, and you know, Mel Gibson said this thing and, and yeah, that's evidence enough for me, this, this, this website I've never heard of. That's fine. Yeah, it's on social media. Like, I, have they thought about this kind of thing enough? That's my question. Because okay, it's so a, a need for connection and discussion, which is why I can't change anyone's thoughts and feelings, but, nor should I try, but just to be willing to have the conversation and go, yeah. hey, hey, can we talk about this? Because yeah. like, I'm not going to just say you're a nutbag, uh -huh. yet, but we need to talk about this and, and you know, find out what's going on. So I hope I'm not going to offend anyone believing in, a, cer in a certain conspiracy theory. <laughs> Um, but what you often see with people with an extreme belief in a certain conspiracy is that they also have a mental illness, like a personality disorder. And I, yeah, I know this, but I'm not saying like, again, I'm not saying everyone, right. But having studied psychology, having seen quite a lot into this, there is actually some truth to that. And like I said, I don't want to offend anyone with this. Um, but most people who are healthy can also think to a certain degree about things and they might not believe the most craziest conspiracy theory ever. They might actually have rational brain that works well and think about things more clearly, where if you would be in a, in a certain mental illness and have bipolar or, or, or schizophrenia, like it's way more. And it's those people often that you hear on the internet. Um, it's way more foggy your brain and it's way more harder to separate reality sometimes for them. And that's where, uh, yeah, conspiracy theories, you can totally fall into believing those more uh, with certain mental illness, actually. I, I don't know. Um, I trust you study psychology and that if that's true for you and that's, that's what you've learned, then I'll, I'll take that. I just know the people that um, I actually used to look up to and, and learn from mm -hmm. that have no kind of, you know, you know, mental illnesses whatsoever and yet have... On the surface, maybe, away, right? You know, their life, their, 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 their career and, and <laughs> just kind of pissed on everything that they've, they've worked towards in terms of people trusting in them for just reasonable, uh, critical thinking. And they have no mental illness and they've just gone down the path of... Uh, but, whatever these things are. And so it's like, wow, we need to understand that there are a lot of people, millions around the world that are watching the kind of videos and, and there's a reason for that, you know? And it's like, sure. what's going on? And so that, that, that interests me rather than worries me mm -hmm. because we need to sit down and, and understand how the other person actually thinks. Mm -hmm. um, whether they can do then do that back or not, I mean, but the effort has to come from somewhere. Huh? Yes. Well, not to say that the people that you know will have a mental illness, but not, and not always that you need that, right? To believe in something, absolutely not. That's not what I mean or, you know. Uh, but it can also be, not always it's clear that someone is struggling with some kind of mental illness. Uh, you know, the outside can look fine, but the inside could be very different. Um, but besides that, what would you, what kind of would you suggest then, like on this? Or what would you want to see changed? Or what would you suggest to people to pay more attention on or to? I'm probably going to sound like I'm parroting someone like Jordan Peterson, um, but it's something that I've believed way before I knew of him. And it's my, I'm, I'm, life is an example. And that is just, 
it requires a level of self awareness and self responsibility. Yep. To kind of make a decision to say, okay, like I'm responsible for the life that I'm living now, and I'm the only one that's going to be able to not define the life events that happen to me or around me, but how I respond to them. And if I want to get out of the situation where I am clearly not in a great place, I am angry, I am fearful, um, then I need to kind of do something about that. Um, and that's a, that's a big step, and that's not something you can just throw at someone that's clearly finding perhaps purpose, significance, you know, um, and even connection, like basic fundamental needs through connecting with people um, from tapping into something like a conspiracy theory. But it's something that the, we have to learn from ourselves. Um, so that's not like a teaching you can just put out there and someone goes, oh, okay, it's, it's a revelation. And it often happens from a wake up call or something like that. Um, but so beyond that, I think I also love to see, um, <laughs> it needs to, for that to happen, I guess so, but also a, more of an attempt to, to, to communicate, more of an attempt to connect and to understand each other and to stop it, from, for it to be a less of an us versus them thing. And who can start to make that happen? Yeah, institutions. And then that comes down to, for me, why that's not likely at the moment is because of the advertising model that uh, permeates media and has done for decades, you know, social media especially, you know, this idea that we can make money from us being the product of, of what we're paying attention to and clicking on or watching or whatever. Um, and to, to get people's attention, we need to tap into base fears and we need to create that sense of separation, etc. So that's a big problem. And we have to kind of almost rise above that and, uh, that means stepping away from social media. That means uh, learning to use it more effectively. That means mm -hmm. having more sovereignty you know, in our own lives. And what is a sovereign individual? It's someone that's self-aware of like who they are, where they're going, what their kind of uh, drive is, you know, and, 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 and being aware of their own emotional states and not being kind of led by them so much. And then, it, of course, to be able to do that, you, you need to take responsibility for where you're at and do some a fair amount of personal work, um, mm -hmm. which if the earlier it can start, the better. Interestingly, and I'll shut up in a sec, um, schools like uh, these kind of alternative schools like Waldorf, um, kids that come out of there, it doesn't always work, but they seem to be a bit more sovereign and aware from a much younger age. And I know that from you know, friends of mine who've put their kids through them. And I think Denmark an experiment or there was a time when a lot of them went through schools like that too. And, and, and so it proved and there was a much more uh, sort of sovereign individual that was more self-aware and didn't get, get caught up and, and take things so personally all the time. I think that's, um, that would help a lot. Basically about, I don't know, 90 or 99% of things in life are a skill and self-awareness is definitely among them that you can get better at but it helps when you actually get more exposed earlier at age at that skill and already have someone to show you how to level it up. Um, but yes, self-awareness is a big one. Probably the, the one right on that. So, yep. Mm -hmm. So it's you, my friend. <laughs> sorry. Over to you, I feel like uh, there was almost a pause there that meant we could switch to another topic because we could, we've covered several here, actually. I just, I felt like I'm, I'm hogging the space and if you wanted to move on to talk about bikes or, or, or anything else, then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unless you want to say something more on, on this, then go ahead. Otherwise, to keep things dynamic here and, and fun, I uh, would actually share uh, another one out of my list that I had. <laughs> Do that um, to the last topic. Let's just say in a kind of a sort of preposterous spiritual kind of way, I am complete and move on. Awesome. So let's see um, which one to ask. Uh, I have two more though, so it's not like I have so many. But uh, there's one that I wrote on the sides that I wasn't sure that I was gonna ask, but I think it kind of ties into with something that we talked about a bit earlier. So I am actually going to ask it. Um, so I had two friends, uh, two P 
people that I've had a lot of great experiences with um, who both have let me down um, by saying a certain thing that actually really hurt me. And, and this is the thing why I'm linking to something that we talked about earlier is to ask advice, which I don't often do sometimes to people. And I'm actually going to ask advice from you <laughs> on this. So how to talk to someone who disappointed you? Like, I know, I know a few steps. I know a few things that I can do, but I just want to have your opinion on this. Like, if something comes up, right? If something comes up that you feel like, okay, that's what I would do or approach or how I would approach this. How would you approach, yeah, this, how, when someone disappointed you? Because it hurts inside, like. Yeah, okay, so is this, to clarify what we're talking about, um, because then there's very different uh, sets of language and approaches. When someone crosses a boundary, that you set, then there's reason for anger. And then there's like, you need, to, you need to restate that boundary and you need to express that it's not okay for you. What I'm hearing is not that, but I'm just double checking that it isn't. Um, because what I'm hearing is you're saying that someone's disappointed you and let you down. Mm-hmm. And my approach to that, even if it was someone that let me down, it's like, okay, how am I responsible for this? Because I've placed and projected a standard or an expectation on that person to behave in a certain way and I are they aware that that's you know that's what I require of them yeah, yeah, yeah. if they are then we need to speak to that and and say hey buddy and be really honest and say look still not you made me feel like this that's not fair but then go okay when you said this it made me feel like that and I just need you to know that because I care about our friendship and yeah. I need to be real about this and then you can find out what they're really made of but if you, you can't do that unless they know that that was expected of them. And so that question goes to you. Like in this case where they've let you down, mm. uh, who's responsible, you know, in that situation? I mean, both of you are 100% responsible, but um, you know what I mean? That's how it's a healthy way to look at it. But where do you start from? Did they know that they, this, is, this was a way that they could have let you down? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. Um, And that's exactly where communication, uh, but uh, I guess they know, but probably I haven't expressed it with enough words to make it more clear, you know? So I guess that's exactly what you're saying, what I should uh, take as advice and actually uh, do to just let them know, like, look, it hurt me because of this reason. Um, and then take it from there, right? Yeah. If someone's like, you know, offended or let down, um, I'll give you an example from my own life. When someone uh, uh, kind of cancels on me for lunch or something like that, or they, you know, they don't show up for a call, they're super late for a call, um, that bugs, that lets me down. Um, but there's actually more anger than anything else. And, because um, it's crossed a boundary, which again, I haven't actually set or expressed. And is it reasonable to do that? And when I look inside, it's like, when they do that, it makes me feel kind of like I have no value. Now, that's how I perceive things because I have a sort of a, a core belief set up that's going to trigger that. That's not their responsibility. It's me, my responsibility to say, hey, Jeff, um, I just need you to know that when you showed up 20 minutes late for that call, it made me feel like you didn't value me as a human. And then I just got triggered and, and you know, I, I can't ask you to always show up on time, um, but I just need you to know that that's how it makes me feel. And, I'm, you know, you're not responsible for that, mm-hmm. but it would help if you were on, on time. And how, how do you feel about that? You know, because yeah, yeah. they might be aghast in, in some kind of way. They're like, I had no idea. Um, they're still not responsible. And it's, it's really important that I, I stay in that space. But just you expressing how you felt about it Mm-hmm. The other human is not a sociopath, I assume. They're going to be like, oh, oh, wow, cool, okay, thank you for that. And then, you know, hopefully not get triggered and then respond in a cool way. So. Sure, hopefully they will not get triggered, exactly. But uh, yes, and I know or knew those exact, the advice that you gave now, that that would be the steps to take. But it's good to get another 
to get the same, well, to get your opinion actually on this. Because as I said, I kind of knew what I had to do, but it's sometimes also the feeling of not feeling alone in making that decision then. And something also we kind of, that you shared there. And, and so, yeah, so thanks actually for, for giving your opinion on that. Um, this was a little exercise for me to actually try to ask for some advice. So uh, that's awesome uh, that you gave some good one there. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's great to just be fed back, you know, just to hear like, well, actually I was thinking that anyway, Yeah. yeah but there's, exactly. there's a question of self-worth that we're all working with. And yep. so sometimes it's just, it's helpful to get that reflection back. Like, Oh, well, it was okay to say that actually. Yeah. We sometimes need that, just that little kind of assurance from, from somebody else that actually know that is okay to, to do that. Um, because again, it's, it's, it's a delicate situation when feelings get hurt. How do you go about sort of balancing out and ex mm -hmm. releasing that emotional tension that you feel without projecting onto the other person and, and then the conflict that none of us actually want to kind of deal with, right? Yes, exactly. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Nice. So don't have to get too much more around this. Um, it's not like destroying my life or anything, right? So it's, it's good to leave it with that actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, if you have something more on your list, um, please go ahead. It all feels kind of heavy. Um, <laughs> uh, when I look at it, I mean, it feels well, kind of heavy. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is just who I am, you know, like I, I, I do drink beers and, and, and uh, rum and, and, and get and back rum. and have a good time. And I like watching Tottenham Hotspur score football goals, you know. <laughs> um, and yet when we're talking like this, it's, you know, I'm not going to be going too deep into that. What, what, what I'm motivated to talk about, what, what drives me is this. Uh, this sense of kind of connection and, and, and this, this kind of crisis of meaning that I'm seeing around a lot of us and, and especially in the, the drive for, for purpose, mm. you know, like everyone's searching for purpose. And that's a topic I can and have bleated on about often. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. I'd love to hear your perspective on why people are uh, void of meaning and the searching for purpose is such a big deal and what you can do about that. That's a, whew, that's a good question, actually. Uh, it's a very difficult one to, well, I mean, to, yeah. It's complex, that's why it's difficult, because there's many layers to it. Um, there's actually an interesting um, study or research that was, or well, study actually, but uh, where, when a world disaster, I don't know exactly the place, but happens, the rates of depression, people saying that they were lonely, having no purpose, those rates dropped drastically because all of a sudden they were asked to come together and to work together as, you know, a one, oneness, like a, a community on this purpose of, of surviving and working together. And <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think, I think in what modern society has done well is to provide a safety you know like we don't have to hunt we are all safe nothing is chasing us hopefully uh but with that safety i also think there is um there's some troubles with that that we are feeling inside like instincts that we have that are showing up as errors right now because they're not being fulfilled and i think where this feeling of like lack of purposeness comes from is because we're not needed in modern society so much. Like, yes, you can have a job and you can have a role, but in the end, someone can replace you in a way. Like, yeah. And this is just me thinking about this now, right? About what I feel from observing from people suffering from this like lack of purposeness is that they feel like they're not really needed in a world that actually doesn't need you in a way or in a society that doesn't actually need you. And what, I don't know what you can do about it. Um, yeah, I actually well, don't you know. tapped into the answer. I'd love to you to elaborate because I think you tapped into the, the big C word for me when you talked about mm. you know, that, that study, you know, and how as soon as the oh, community. people found community. Yeah, yeah. 
mm-hmm. yep. things shifted. So, you know, there's something in that for me. Like, what comes up for you? Good that you're actually bringing that back because that's true. And everyone who is or who has experienced this feeling of true community, like of really belonging in a group of people, can all of a sudden feel that's life. This is it, you know, where you feel like everyone is, everyone is needed together. And I think we're, because we're with so many people in a city, for example, it would be nicer. I think people will be happier actually in smaller groups because that's where you can feel community in a big city. It's hard to feel like a community because there's too many people. It's too much. Um, but yeah, finding your community, I think it might actually come down to that. To find your community between or through all. Yeah, um, but it's diff- like, well, it doesn't have to be maybe difficult in a way, but a community where you can also feel like you have a purpose in, and maybe you can find it in very simple things like in a certain sport, right, that you're doing to find a sense of community there. Um, I might actually tackle it more to that when you have this lack of purposeness to try to find a community where you feel like you belong and that sense of purposeness or purpose will come with that all uh, too. Um, and communities can be found in many places, but it's putting the effort in, in finding it. Like I said, like in a sport or people who think about certain things uh, in a way people who have conspiracy theories, you can find a great sense of community there too. I guess that's what people are actually, yeah, drives them to that maybe too. Um, but so I guess, and all right, so let me, let me come back, like, go to you. What, like, why do you feel, or what are your thoughts on that word community and purpose? Cause for you, it was a big word. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, it's not to say that everyone who finds community, I, I think, automatically has purpose, but the, the, the search for that, which really is the search for, for meaning, is, you know, is uh, perhaps not as prominent, you know, it's because it's like, well, we're, we're, we're creatures that are not designed to sit on our own, unless we're like, you know, the 0.001% of humans that are, just choose to be renunciates and monks right. and just want to sit on their own. Like that's, that's not. But that doesn't count helpful. for many, many, like that's just so many, so few people that it doesn't in a, in a way count, right? For most people being together is the most healthy thing that you can do. Like having people around you, right? For your longevity. Go on. Sorry. You know, yeah, I agree. And, and for longevity, especially if you look at the blue zones around the world, you know, like that's just, you know, red wine's another thing, which I'm very happy about. <laughs> red wine community. Um, <laughs> very relieved about that. Um, but how you fit into this community and what your role is there, you know, what we've lost um, to indigenous cultures, meaning, sorry, let me rephrase that. What we've lost having kind of moved away from that is this, this sense of the elders having a role you know we just you retire you don't yep. work and do something anymore that kind of trading money for time career thing they stop that and then they have no purpose they have no meaning unless mm. they choose to continue working in some way or they're given a role where they find uh, they find themselves being useful yep and if not then we start to sort of see like you know alzheimer's and dementia and, and, and but if you look to indigenous cultures and also people that uh, have a role in some way and uh, still find there's a reason to get up in the morning purpose mm. essentially yep they're, they're fine and they last a lot longer interestingly you know and how much wisdom they have to pass down you know it's just we've lost a lot of that and that's a, that's a problem and so your role within a community um can simply be being of use to others i think that is is more important than finding some grandiose idea of purpose that it's true. Um, has to mean you know affecting loads of different people or saving the world or, or mm. anything like that. If you, have, if you can um, find value in being of use to others through having a beautiful, um, uh, taking care of the garden for the community or something, if that, you know, it gives you happiness, then and people say, oh, that's beautiful, thank you. Or you, you're a great grandparent or something very simple like that. And it's also profound because it gives you meaning. Yep. And I think um, that can also be like enough for a lot of people. You know, it doesn't have to be something huge. 
but it has to be within a sense of a community that is built on a sense of shared values. I think that, that really helps. Interesting that you touched upon the elderly because exactly in modern society, they are, you work towards retirement and then you're actually too old to have a purpose in society. Like it kind of feels like that in a way, right? While they actually have a lot of knowledge. I mean, they have life, right? They have experienced life, uh, which is life experience that young people would not have or don't have, you know, can't have right yet. That could be so interesting if they could actually be, yeah, actually share that wisdom more uh, to young people. And I guess in smaller tribal communities, that's where you often see that where the elder person is the one with the wisdom and the knowledge sharing what he or she learns and the other people can follow on on that. But we don't have that actually uh, here. So it's yeah. more of an Eastern thing, right? You know, if you've, you've, we've both lived in Bali for a time and, you know, you see that, like they all live together. And yeah. the idea of me living near my grandparents, like I was like, ah, there's a time when it was almost close. And, um, you know, it's a sadness to me that I didn't get to. Um, right. Although, who knows? You know, looking in retrospect, who knows? But they, this is a very different thing. You know, they, they still play a really key role. They still live together in a compound, if not a house. And that's, that's a very thing you see around Asia a lot. And the more westernized it becomes, and you see in China, like places like that, when it, it shifts away from that, then I think we are losing something for sure. For sure, yeah. Um, and that is also like, I mean, you do have statistics of like loneliness and, and suicidal rates that it also like it peaks with like suicide rates peak with um, um, teenagers. Uh, but it also is a huge one with uh, elderly people and loneliness as well, which makes sense, right? Because once they are old and on retirement, there's sort of, yeah, no purpose anymore. And so the result of that can be loneliness and the result of loneliness can lead to more, you know, like suicide. Uh, yeah, it's not in our culture, like in, in, at least not in Europe and in the US and, you know, in the Western world where to like in, in Bali, it is a part of their culture and we're definitely losing something with that. Like you said, yeah. Hmm. Interesting topic, like really uh, interesting one, actually, that I like to talk about. Because uh, I am trying, actually, also with the IPS project, not with elderly people, per se, them, but with, I mean, not like they can be in there, but like I'm trying to get sort of a, or I'm working more on trying to get like this community of, of organizing trips that brings people together and puts them into nature where you have a shared purpose of, of, of surviving, you know, or, or of, of doing something as a group together. I, because I really feel like this is such a needed thing where technology is separating us more and more and more. It's also bringing us together, but in different ways than I think the ways that we actually as humans need. Um, I think, I mean, this, this, uh, this fucking screen, as my therapist <laughs> describes it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's enabled so much, but in this enforced kind of lockdown situation that we're finding ourselves in, again, um, it's, it's quite limiting. And the, the, the human contact that yeah. deep down we know, no one disagrees with that. Deep down we know we need that. Mm -hmm. If we, the, the next, uh, the extension of that is our connection to the world around us and, and mm. nature is it not? you know and, and so these kind of i guess the things you're putting together and i think that people are craving for is just getting out into nature because as soon yeah. as you get out there especially big nature hills forests, mountains your problems are not in front of you and mm. there's something that just kind of chills you out a little bit and just gives you a sense of perspective and then bring in the community aspect of that and there's a shared goal or, or game or something like that um, and then we're just not going to lost souls walking around forests that can't see the wood for the trees as the expression goes in English but there's there's something kind of deeply bonding going on and um, the more of that the better and I know for a fact that there's so much money being invested by companies you know CEOs and, and, and 
you know, top level management just kind of paying to get themselves out of their offices into these kind of experiences. And yeah. Like, oh, here I am again. You know what I mean? Because like, all yeah, these responsibilities yeah. they think are important. You can just chill out for a moment. And when you, again, you come back to that sense of self for a moment, independence, sovereignty, and connection and belonging. We've got something going on, but we need to extend that beyond trips for those that can afford it. Mm-hmm. It's something that becomes more part of our culture somehow. And yeah, that's the best real... to figure out how to do that. I don't know. Yeah, that's a real tricky one, right? Because everyone knows in a way that nature is good and healthy. And from hearing this as well, they might be like, yeah, right. I should go more out. But then many people don't do it. They don't do it more regularly or they don't connect more regularly with people, even though they know it is good. Uh, And so, yeah, it is in the end more making this a part of our culture, I guess, which is a very tricky thing. But Who's responsible it is, for that ultimately? Isn't it? It's, it's an individual decision, I guess, at the end of the day, right? Sure. And and what I just want to say, like, it is also we're having conversations like this, which are happening more and more because people are having this possibility of creating, everyone can do a podcast now these days. And, you know, so it's awesome where this can be spread. And it's true that that awareness can be spread as well. And then, like you said, the individual individual choice uh, needs to be made by that person, of course, but you do need also awareness to have that option to make a choice on something. So, yeah, I guess this is helping um, in certain ways uh, to it all. But yeah, I wonder how much, but uh, yeah, I guess it's doing something at least. I guess this goes back to. There's a general theme which has been running through all of the, our conversation, for me at least. Um, even the questions that you sort of posed earlier, you know, the theme is kind of uh, awareness, responsibility, and kind of like emotional connection. Yeah. You know, just be like, hey, this is how I feel. This is what's going on. And being willing to kind of um, ask for advice or uh, ask for support and, and share what's going on and, and be, be real about that, you know, like this, this sort of a, a authentic inquiry within the self and then authentic relating to others like that's that's kind of the key piece i think that the the, the tools and the modalities exist but mm. uh, it'd be great if they were kind of uh taught more and they would appear more and by conversations like this happening and the amount of courses that i offer <laughs> that um, i'm on you know i'm always learning as well as teaching and like sense making you know just kind of just getting us to take a step back from being a part of the narrative and just looking at it and going Wow, you know, like this, it feels like that's really, really important. Um, yeah. So, I'm excited for the future. Despite my kind of concerns for um, entire kind of countries seemingly collapsing and voting in very strange ways, there's a reason for it, and it's for me, it's a disconnect. You know, so it, it comes back to this idea of, okay, who are you? Let's get beyond the fear and just connect with the person opposite me around me. Because deep down, we all want to do that. We just locked in with this sense of fear and perception that means that you're potentially dangerous and it's um Mm. it's so easy just to drop out of that it's so easy Mm. just in any kind of workshop or any conversation just to take a moment and say one person can leave by saying this is what i'm feeling right now and and, and being really honest Mm. it just drops everyone into a space of like wow like i just showed that he was judging everyone and was afraid and is it okay for me to do that too? It's like, yes, yes, we're all human, you know? Um, so I'm excited about the, the, the possibilities for shifts and change like that. It's just like someone's got to lead the way. Yeah. Um, well, and also stand up and say, hey, look, you know what? That's, that's not cool. That's, we can do better than that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm excited that you're doing this work because uh, I think you're doing good work on it. So that's awesome, actually. Mm-hmm. Thanks, man. It's um. It's, it's a reason for me to get out of bed, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, sure. It's, it's, uh, it, it drives me without though. Yeah, yeah. I, found a, I found a niche. Nice. <laughs> All right, so let me, let me ask you, um, oh yeah, let me ask you something um, of another thing here, right? So I also want to add some things on this uh, as well, if that, like, Okay, so how to deal with haters? 
And in a way, everyone will deal with this, you know, with people disliking you or hating you. Everyone will deal with that throughout their life. But like you and like me as well, when you are more out on the internet, you will deal with, not per se that, that you will, I, I'm not saying that you have a lot of hate or, or that I receive a lot of hate or something, right? But the more you're exposed to people, the more likely that you will also get more comments from people who dislike you because you're more exposed to people, right? So you're sort of doubled to possibly uh, negative negative people or, or hate, right? And so I feel like you might have a bit more of ways to deal with this. I'm not sure, but I at least am starting to think more about this because of some more exposure that I'm getting here and there. And with that, sometimes people disliking or, or, or you know. Um, and I'm just curious, like, how are you approaching this? Not per se alone on the internet, although that's of a real concern these days to anyone as well. Even when you're just posting something on Facebook as a person, all of a sudden you can be exposed to other people commenting on that with something that they don't like about you or whatever, right? So it's actually the virtual and the real world where hate can come from now. Like if you're getting bullied, you know, for teenagers, for example, it's not alone in school, but it's also virtually, you know, cyberbullying, real thing. Uh, but other other uh, thing there. But uh, just dealing with hate or people disliking you. How how do you approach this in life? And yeah on the internet or whatever. I'll start with a great quote, which just really landed for me. And it's, right, from, a book it. called, it's called, from a book called The Courage to Be Disliked, mm -hmm. which is a, a beautiful, um, it's a conversation between a philosopher and a student about uh, Adlerian psychology. And Adler was a guy that was around at the time of Freud and Jung, mm -hmm. um, and was kind of hanging around with him and did his own thing. And I'm super down with his approach. Um, and the quote, uh, which comes from the book, I can't attribute it to Adler, was freedom is, get it right. <laughs> you can paraphrase. Um, something like freedom is uh, being disliked by other people. It's true. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, of course, that if I'm being myself, then I'm free. But that's, that means that I'm going to be pissing someone else off. I'm going to be sure. triggering somebody else. Mm -hmm. Like before I kind of go off on what, you know, uh, how I deal with it, like let's be real and honest. Um, I was terrified of public speaking. Most people are more afraid of public speaking than they are death, which is, you know, it's understandable true. given that death is abstract and that public speaking is relatable because no one wants to feel like they don't belong. They don't, the attention's on them. What if they get something wrong? It's, it's relating to belonging like we talked about. So it's a big deal to do this. And uh, it was a, without going into the details and the stories of it, but it was a big deal for me to learn to stand up in front of people. Now I'm told I'm a good speaker. Cool. Guess what? I was, you know, changing my underwear before. <laughs> Not literally. Um, but <laughs> it was a even big... if even if I would understand. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I did sort of like smoke a cigarette and stuff like after teaching my first English lesson, you know, many, many years ago. And you people would say to me, oh, you look really calm up there. It's like, really? So you never know what's going on inside someone, right? But it's a big deal to kind of learn to put yourself up, out there, especially if rejection is, is a big thing you're afraid of. You just have to learn to experience it and get over it, right? Yeah. Um, but you know you're doing something right if people are coming out against you and they're saying something they don't like. But the golden rule is like, it's one of the four agreements from that book. You know? ah, yeah. Never mm -hmm. take things personally, even yes. if it's something positive. You're the best speaker I've ever seen. Mm. Well, am I? <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. They think you are based on their experience. Don't take that personally either. It's, you know, like be real with where you're at. I posted a video a couple of years back on YouTube talking about my transition away from the Wim Hof method as an instructor of that and to do my own thing. Yeah. And someone delightfully decided to kind of comment 
literally narcissistic personality disorder. <laughs> I was like, that was the comment. That was the comment. It was like, beautiful. Thanks for stopping by. What? Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> can we hang out? You know, like, wow, good to meet you, brother. You yeah, see, that's like, what I mean. Uh, may I go yeah. on? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, instant reaction is like, oh, wow. Like, fuck you, man. Um, but then it's like, okay. What does that say? And this is where shadow work comes in. This is where self-worth comes in. You know, like, what does that say about that person? And if I understand why I'm triggered by something you would say earlier on, that's got nothing to do with you. It's got something that I haven't integrated in myself. And once you learn that and you embody some of that yourself, then it's just like, how do you deal with it? To so answer your actual question, you don't, you ignore it. You absolutely ignore it. You don't give them the attention they want because you're just adding fuel to their shitty little fire. You know, like hate is a strong word. And when you say hater, I'm like, I don't sure. hate anything. You know, and I'm not saying it's an incorrect word, but I don't hate anything because of what, what I, I don't truly hate anything. But I know deep down there's just like a resistance to experiencing that human or that thing because there's something going on in me, right? And so that's what's going on for them. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of want to have compassion for them and that's the ultimate you know i'm not going to just say like every time i see someone say something like that i have compassion for them and i just sit there and breathe for a bit no i'm just like fucking prick you know but ultimately i want to work towards having compassion for that person because buddhism kind of says it very simply and subtly right like suffering uh, can only be caused by someone else that is suffering they say it more like yes but it's true right and so like anytime that happens it's like Okay, brother, you have a, you're a bit, not quite as far down the garden path and I wish you all the best, but I'm not going to give you the time of day to spit your venom at me. You know, go deal with that shit yourself. And I just always move on really quickly. And then it's gone. Mm. Always gone. When you start attracting more of that into your life and you've got people going on, there's a couple of reasons, you know. Um, one of them is if you look at it from a universal perspective and you're open to, you know, the universe throwing things at you like that as a test, then why are you doing that? What in your life is, is attracting that energy? What are you giving out? Mm-hmm. What part of you is kind of like creating that energy to then attract that kind of thing? That's one sure. way to look at it. The other is just like, you're doing something right. You're doing something right. You know, mm-hmm. good for you. Great. That's a sign of progress. You're going to trigger and piss people off and um, well done. You know? Yeah. And I think also when someone says something that might dislike what, what you, um, hold on. Uh, when, when someone says something that you dislike, um, it is also good to see the difference between feedback and something negative, you know, that has no meaning. Um, because it's sometimes also hard to take, so actually, hold on, let me, let me, cause I wrote a few things down on how I sort of co-op with this and a few ones that you said, I feel listed too. So that's, uh, I, I'm just gonna, uh, l- l- list them too. So, um, so you give what you have inside. That's the same, like what you said, uh, which hundred percent agree. And it's so true. Uh, if you have hate in you, um, you will likely give that to the world as well. So, uh, but then what I was trying to say just a few minutes ago is that when someone says something that you dislike or is triggering something, before getting emotional, try to distance yourself for a second and ask yourself the following question. What is this person trying to tell me? You know, like if someone says, you suck or you know i don't know like trying to ask that person like what exactly do you mean so i can understand what you're trying to say and the more you're understanding their point the more you can yeah get it what they're actually trying to say and and those words because you also put a meaning on it when someone says you suck you immediately you can take it very personal but when it gets more clarity and more understanding, it is more easier to take it less like personal because you understand their perspective of what they're thinking and why they said it. So that's something that I always try to do when I, when someone says something. Um, and I think, uh, and last 
one that I that I have uh, is more like a general thing is that in everything good you can find something bad. So the greatest people who have changed the world in the most positive way, there is always going to be someone who is going to dislike what they did. Always. You know, so for everyone, it is holds true. Even if you did the most incredible thing, there is always a person who will dislike what you did. And maybe this is more like a general fact, just that everyone, there's always someone out there who will dislike anything, whatever. Um, but that comes more to the thing that you give what you have inside, I think. So, um, yeah, but loved the things that you said there. Uh, all good ways. I'll, go, I'll pick up on something you said, actually, um, if I can. Yep. And also just acknowledge that, you know, we're triggered constantly all the time. Like people are watching us talk right now at some point have, are looking at you or me or maybe both of us and going prick. Yeah. You know? like, <laughs> I don't like that person in this moment. You look at the way they're sitting or, or talking, there's something going on, you know, and it's, it's, I do it, you do it. It's, it's reality and it's catching ourselves and going, Oh, okay. <laughs> what in me, um, you know, is, is not okay with that. Mm. You know, and what can I learn? What is it that, that person is doing that I don't get to do? That's the question, that's the key, that's the goal, you know, to kind of ask yourself yep. in that moment. I mean, again, there are times when someone is just really obnoxious and not, sure. um, you know, producing any good qualities at all. And that, that's, that's not being triggered. That's just being like, I, that person's not got a great energy and I'm not mm. going to, but very often it's, it's more subtle than that, you know, and it's like, a, we, have, we, have to, we, ask, we have to ask ourselves. Um, I wanted to go back and pick up on the, Second to last point that you made, but I've forgotten it now because I've just got carried away with that point. Can you just quickly reference what it was? Uh, yeah. So the last one that I shared there was in everything good, you can find something bad. The one before that. Sorry. Um, hold on. Let me see. Uh, what is this person trying to say or tell me? Ah, yeah. That's yep. a really interesting one. Like, do you engage with that person? Right? Like, I sure. found that trying to engage online is mm. a thankless task because uh, yeah. it often becomes a performance because you know that what you're saying is actually on show for other people and that you're actually you know directly responding to them mm. but you know you're, you're doing it for a reason uh, not just to engage with them otherwise you could take it privately a lot of the time um and it, it more often than not descends into a shit show right and that's not to say that there's no value in trying to engage with that person because as you said like What's behind that comment, you know? And if you can touch them there, I mean, I do it like uh, in workshops, like in real life, and someone says something and it's like, ooh, there's a challenge. There was some energy. Like, is this the moment to tackle that now? Shall I take them to the side? Or would this benefit everyone from actually just speaking to what was going on? And that's a, a really good quality, I think, to, to, to try and do, right? Like, do we have the patience? Do we have the energy? Is it worth investing the energy? And Offline, I think it's essential that we do that yep. um, when appropriate. Uh -huh. uh, but online, my tendency is to, to question the question the, the the necessity of that, you know, because mm. it's it's it, it, it rarely works out well. You know, that person is ready after a discussion. They're ready coming to it with an open mind, <laughs> you know. But that's not to say that it couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's really where we want to be going long term. It's like just to open that up. But when people do that, they're, they're more driven for attention rather than uh, connection, I think. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's a problem. Yeah. It's interesting that we need to learn how to navigate now in two different kind of worlds, right? It's like the online worlds and the offline worlds on how to cope with those things because it's true. Because uh, sometimes I have on a course, like a review, someone just writes, this sucks. And I'm like, <laughs> all right. Like, and I mean, this is like, <laughs> this is like 1% of the other people who, who are giving like five star ratings and it's all great. Right. But then there's this one person and I'm like, I think, and this is like a thing that I was touching upon a bit earlier. Like, is that, is this useful? Like, you know, I could ask him, well, like, could you be more cl like, clear what you're trying to tell me many times they'd never reply on that uh but i always try to put the attention in that because you never know 
Uh, but in general, I'm more, actually, I'm more leaning to like, okay, there's nothing in this, in this comment, in this review that I can use. So it's better to just leave it aside and ignore it because there's no value in it at all for me, nor for that person, nor for anyone to kind of reply on that. So, but yes, the more you are exposed on the internet as someone, the more you're dealing with those situations and they're very new for us to navigate in as humans, right? Like the internet's quite new in a way to our species, to our existence. Uh, and so it's a real challenge to try to navigate by, yeah, how to, how to communicate and talk on it. I'm, uh, I'm 40 now and I'm of that kind of generation of, I was born in 1980 and there's a generation of sort of like five years and before that people kind of um they by the time they were adults pretty much like the internet and all that kind of stuff was just not even there yet and then they had to get used to the internet as adults and be like and you know you, you can see that like uh, 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 yeah. uh, and he's like oh come on come here and then you got people that are younger than me missing that margin that grew up with the internet in their lives as soon as they were kind of, you know, learning to deal with stuff. And I'm in that weird sort of uh, crossover period where yeah. I was using tape cassettes to record stuff, you know, and, and I, I experienced like the first mobile phones as a teenager and then grew into that world. And so it's a weird kind of cusp where I've got, I'm sort of fragmented between both of these generations. I'm not entirely sure what that means. I just found the article really interesting, but it does, I can't relate to people that grew up with the internet just being the standard for communication, for arranging meeting up, you know, and the, the, the speed of mm. uh, communication, the rate of change that they're dealing with, the, how they quickly have to process information, how quickly they have to respond to stuff. And when we're talking about uh, receiving feedback online and the lack of nuance, yep that text messages, et cetera, you know, and, and I don't want to become like a shitty English teacher that's like having a go at the short form that we now use in, in like later and stuff like that and bobs. I, I just think it's funny, you know, but uh -huh. the nuance is, is being lost a little bit. And, and in that pivotal stage of like, especially like teenagers that you mentioned earlier that are now really getting pretty fucked up nice and early, yeah. even more so, Emotional uh, awareness and, and emotional um, intelligence, if you want to use that phrase, mm -hmm. not being taught and, and all of this gubbins is, is it's not helping. You know, it's doing the complete opposite. You know, I remember a life where I could step away from that. Yeah. And that wasn't my standard. And I go away once, at least once a year, turn my phone off for a week. I want to do it more. Mm. Cold, you know, but watch the social dilemma, you know, it's, it's got some really interesting points in it and the level of addiction and what people can and can't do now. It's uh, kind of frightening. Yeah, it is. It is actually. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's even for young people, even when they grew or, or grow up with it, it's so confusing because even the elderly or people older than them don't always know how to navigate in that world because it's too new. It's too new for everyone even if you're born with it. Um, and it's changing too fast too. So it's, you can never adapt in a way to it because it changed maybe next year or in 10 years to something entirely different. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, but anyway, I think those were some good points uh, that you shared on um, coping with, yeah, with people who dislike you. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else that you still had. This were actually the last, that was the last uh, one that I had on my list. I don't know if there's something more that you had. Nope. Dry, man. You've, you've you know, dried me out. Of, uh, I can talk about a bunch of different things. You throw a question at me, I'll, 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 no doubt I'll have something to say. Same. Whether it's of value or not, I don't know, but I'm out of mm. questions. So same, but I think that could be good for or another one somewhere in the future. Uh, one thing that I am actually curious about, uh, and I kind of want to end it maybe with that, uh, it's, but I'm curious to ask you though, and I don't know how much you want to get into it, but you said that you turned 40. <laughs> I'm just curious because, you know, the, those are like milestones in a way, like, you know, 20, 30, 40, 
big kind of new chapters in certain ways for some people. I'm curious, like how did turning 40, how did that feel? Like, did it feel just like, oh, just another day or, or did you had a lot of thoughts behind it and a lot of emotions? Yeah, it's, it's a significant age, right? Um, yeah. And the meaning that, you, you know, you give anything, nothing has any meaning other than the meaning you give it, right? Sure. Like that goes yeah. for anything in life. And so mm-hmm. some people can think it's a big deal, some not. For me, my parents, that's kind of my experience of what 40 means, right? And so mm-hmm. when my parents were 40, they're 40, 41, uh, I was like 10 years old. Mm-hmm. so I always was like in my mind okay so I'm gonna have a kid around 30 that's kind of normal isn't it and yet here I am I'm still single um uh no no partner no kids I'm 40 I have a home here in uh, Portugal which I like I rent a house in Hamburg I wouldn't totally call either of them like the places that I really want to settle forever mm. um what does that mean you know like ah where's the family thing and, and I want these things and so it's it's I think it's, uh, if you have these standards in mind or things that you want and you don't have them and you reach a milestone age, Mm. I definitely, there's a part of me that's like, oh, what does that mean about me? You know, and so there there are emotions around that. What am I doing on my 40th, you know? Um, And I had a nice gathering of friends on a beach in Bali. It was cool. I think that um, Compared to a lot of people, I've, I've seen a lot, I've done a lot, I have a lot of freedom and I've done some great things with my life, which yeah. you know, if I die tomorrow, I'd be like, I'm pretty well, you know, I feel like there's been a bit of contribution back there. I've, I've seen, I've done, I threw myself off buildings on bungee jumps, um, you know, I've surfed, I've, I've, I've led a life of my own design yeah. and it's beautiful, you know, so in that sense, I'm like, I'm doing well for 40, you know, mm-hmm. if I look to the deep longing of belonging and, and having a family myself. Yeah. There's, there's something missing there. Definitely that I'd, I'd like, mm-hmm. but it's up to me then how I define uh, my response to that. You know, do I sure. give that meaning? Do I think there's something wrong uh, or lacking or missing? Um, and yeah, there's a part of me that's yeah, definitely l- looking at that age and going, time to celebrate what's going on. But if I come from that place of lack, mm. guess what I'm going to create, you know, so it's, it's, it's a challenging one. And I think that's true of any age if you're looking for something like that and you want to sell. Mm. But when I think about it, as a man, unfortunately, um, I have a, a, we have an advantage, you know, like in terms of creating lives and, and that kind of thing. Um, it's not fair. It's just the way that, you know, biology has designed it, if you will. So I'm pretty chilled in that sense. You know, I have plenty of female friends at my age in the same situation going, oh, my fuck. So in that sense, from that perspective, I'm like, you know, I'm healthy, I'm good, I'm in control of my life. Um, and just the way that I see things going, the way that the world is working, like in the life that I've chosen, I have nothing but opportunity in front of me. I have nothing but incredible humans to meet and serve and connect with. And one of them out there is, you know, probably going to say yes at some point. <laughs> you know, and it's like there's this... Three words, I guess, I, I uh, finish up with, which are the three kind of big words for my approach to life and anything that I'm trying to create and how I experience it. Mm-hmm. And they will be trust, faith, and gratitude. Um, and I don't mean faith in kind of God or any particular religion. I just mean faith in just, you know, the fact that it's going to be okay, mm-hmm. you know, and trust in myself, my higher self, if you will, and, and not coming from that lower self place of fear, which we've been talking about a lot. Um, that we can all come from. Mm. Just trusting that it's going to work out, you know, and just faith in something, something bigger out there. And it's not all about me and, and my fucking ego, basically, because I've been down that road and it, there's a, it's a dead end. And then just gratitude for the fact that we get to have conversations like this. Exactly. I get to live this life that I want and I get to create and I have the opportunity to create. And when I come from that place, anything's possible, you know. Does that answer your question? <laughs> it does. And I think this could be a perfect moment actually to round this uh, talk up. Uh, really good way to end it actually. Yes. So that's all.